Hello everybody on YouTube. Hopefully all of you can see this at the moment. Um, yeah, basically tonight we're going to be doing, uh, let me just get my face up there. Uh, hopefully uh, that helps. Um, yeah, basically tonight we're going to be doing a live stream about A-level physics. It'd be great to have as many of you possible uh, putting things in the comments. Uh, that's always really good to see. So I know there's actually uh, people watching. Um, hello, Azi. Hello, Spiritual Speech. Um, Dostra. Uh, Daniel, hello, uh, Phoenix Fighter, Charlie, uh, Darius, let's go, Epic Dragon One, uh, Frances Francesca, Gregory, yo. Um, yeah, so um, please be useful uh, in this video, thanks in advance. Yeah, Epic uh, Dragon, that's my plan. I want to be as useful as possible. However, for all of you out there doing A-level physics exams tomorrow and over the next few weeks, don't forget that although I might say a few little bits which might help you tonight, you have done all of the work already. By this stage, the night before, you have a really, really, really good deep understanding of the physics because that's based on everything you did um, all the way up through GCSE. Then there's also the work that you did in year 12 and year 13 and all of that hundreds of hours of work you've done in class of like doing questions. And your base level of knowledge is super high. This is probably going to be the most amount of physics you will ever know Unless, of course, you're going to do a, uh, university physics in the future. So all of you are thoroughly, thoroughly prepared. And I know that every one of you out there will have been doing many, many hundreds of hours of questions. You'll have been doing past papers and so on. Um, yeah, so um, hello, hello, uh, William, Yar. So just a few, loads of people here. Um, Daniel Speller, yeah, pray this exam is better than AQA paper one. Now, uh, I did a video the other day. I think a lot of you might have seen it. If you saw the video I did the other day when I was out riding my bike, um, and I think about uh, about 17,000 people have seen that on TikTok, which is quite, quite amazing, really. Um, basically, what I said was, is that a lot of you had an absolute shocker with paper one, especially those doing AQA. Um, in the, uh, the comments, just let me know if you did AQA, if you did Edexcel, if you're OCR, if you're WJC, if you're CIE, if you're CCEA, if you are, did I say WJC, if you're EDUCAS, uh, OCRB, let me know which exams um, all of you did. Uh, AQA tends to be the main one. Oh my gosh, that is so much. AQA was brutal, absolutely. Um, I can completely see that, uh, Evan, yeah. Um, OCRB, right. Uh, hello, Phoenix Fighter, you are the a OCRB candidate. Uh, good evening, hope, hope it's all going well for you. Yeah, most of you found that um, AQA was awful. Uh, and actually a lot of you found a OCRA was quite difficult as well. I think um, Edexcel was actually quite a good paper. Now the, the thing is though, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. There's no point talking about it. There's no point trying to work out how quickly or how high somebody might jump if you're estimating uh, how high they went. Um, so yeah, I reckon there's no point dwelling on paper one. What I would say though, is in previous years when I've uh, spoken to students, sometimes they might find that paper one is easy, paper two was horrendous and paper three was fine. So just because paper one was really bad, it doesn't mean that paper two is gonna be the same. It might have been uh, produced by an entirely different set of teachers. It might've been checked by different people uh, who are actually kind of putting the exam together. And I'd have thought that if you've had a really bad paper one, paper two should be okay. Um, but equally, like I said in the video that I put out the other day, if you're finding it as difficult and it's, uh, you know, the questions don't make sense, there's not many easy definitions, there's no ni nice derivations, it's going to be exactly the same for everybody else. And at the very least, take solace in the fact that if you find it difficult, everybody else is finding it difficult as well. And you have done absolutely everything that you can to prepare. Um, yeah, so we said that AQA was a bit like doing Isaac Physics, Esme, uh, was a bit like doing Isaac Physics, but with so much time pressure. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I think that all of you could have done the questions. And I, think, and I think some of the teachers I know who looked at the paper and did the questions said that actually, you know, the questions, they were based on everything that you've learned in the course. They were tricky, but you could do them. But of course, the difficulty is in the exam, there's so much pressure and you know you're against the time and you know that this really matters, that it's not easy. Um, oh yeah, people saying um, that uh, Edexcel was okay. Um, and Mohammed Abdullah, uh, what is the hardest topic in GCSE paper one? Um, I reckon 
let's not worry about that. I'm going to be doing another live stream for GCSE, which is coming up next Wednesday, which is the night before your GCSE physics exams. And if you're asking about paper one, just ignore it. You've already done paper one. That's out of the way. Look forward to paper two and so on. Um, okay, so yeah, please get on with it, uh, Jensen. I, Jensen, I will. Okay, the first thing I want to say is um, I'm just going to switch cameras. Boom, hopefully all of you can see that with a Lego here, as always. Um, the first thing I want to do is say that if there's anything that you need help with tonight, um, maybe uh, you're looking at, uh, you know, maybe 11 o'clock at night, just want to check something and you're not quite sure about it, there's two things I think you should look at. The first one is my website, alevelphysicsonline.com. All of you hopefully should know about that. Um, but the other one is Physics and Maths Tutor. Now, all of you are already using this, I expect. Um, let me know in the comments if you have used Physics and Maths Tutor. Just put PMT in the comments. Uh, let's see how many of you out there are actually using this website all the time. Um, set up by you know a guy um, who wasn't really long out of university. Great guy uh, to talk to. Um, and for all of you out there who've been using PMT, you know what it offers. It offers everything, not just physics and maths, it offers everything. And this is not a paid advertisement. This is just because I will go here if I want to find some older puff papers. Now, on the main thing, there's revision, okay? And if you click on physics, there's physics revision, as you well know. And if you look at A-levels, have a look at the AQA page. Now, even if you are doing OCR and Edexcel or any exam board, what you will find on the AQA page will be useful. So if you click on there, I have clicked. I suspect the servers are going to be overloaded um, tonight. You know, everybody's going to be on it. Uh, so yeah, love PMT. PMT has carried my A-levels. PMT is a godsend. Um, okay, so physics and math tutor. Now, what you can look at here are the topics. Um, now, this again is based on everything for AQA, but the physics is going to be largely the same. And if you want an extra source of questions about a particular topic you're not quite sure about, have a look at the AQA section on physics and math tutor. Um, so for example, uh, maybe you want to be looking at fields and their consequences. I think that's quite a difficult topic in A-level, looking at electric and magnetic fields. Um, I've just clicked on that. Hope it all, uh, hope it all works. The servers have been shocking recently. Yeah, it's, it's only because Everybody's on it. There's like thousands and thousands of students every day. So I've just clicked on fields and their consequences. And uh, in a very short amount of time, I'll just come back to my face at the moment. In a very short amount of time, that will bring up um, kind of, uh, I suppose, downloadable packs with resources in it. It also has, oh no, connection is timed out. Let me go back and uh, see if I can do that again. It might be better the second time. Um, but basically what I have there is what PMT did was they separated questions by topic, including for the multiple choice questions. And what I did over the last few months was actually put stuff together where you can download my work solutions to these. Now it does say here, uh, it's even got my name there, Lewis Matheson from A-Level Physics Online. And if you look at the multiple choice thing, where it says MA, uh, that's kind of the model answers. And what you can do, uh, so this one here, for example, are my work solutions to the multiple choice things for gravitational fields. Um, Honkus, thank you so much. First one of the night. We have got the first big spender. Uh, thank you very, very much for the super chat and the donation. I really, really do appreciate that. Uh, and basically on this page here, you will find the, the multiple choice question. And then there's like a very quick kind of work solution. So you can look at how you actually get to that answer. Um, I would say that when you look at all of this, um, I have found that the mark scheme is always correct. So if you think, well, I think the answer is A, but the mark scheme says B, the mark scheme must be wrong. No, the mark scheme is always correct. So you just got to trust it. So if you want to download questions which cover any topic in more detail, then just go to PMT. All of that is completely free for you to look at. Okay, it's just something that I did because I thought, well, uh, everybody's going to PMT. If people are on PMT, they can come back to my website and I just want to make as much free stuff as possible to help all of you. Now, the other thing that you have uh, access to, and you've had access to it for a couple of years, is A-Level Physics Online. All you need to do here is choose your exam board. So say, for example, I think most of you are um, doing AQA. 
you can find the topic that you need more help with. Again, potentially it's fields and their consequences. Um, on this page here, there's then all the topics I've made videos for. So gravitational fields, Kepler's third law, satellites, electric fields, electric potential, anything that you might want to look at. Um, yeah, so maybe you want to look at the AQA capacitors. Um, some of this is behind the paywall. Uh, you can just log in. Uh, let me just do my details. Do you know, I'm just going to have to type it out. One second. Uh, watching me type something quite slowly is not the most interesting. Fraser Steele. Thank you so much. Good person. Good man. 0 0.79 pence. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate any um, anything like that. Uh, Yusuf Ahmed, can I make physics online free for today, please? No, I've already given you all of the PMT stuff completely for free. So um, this basically allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. If I didn't charge a small amount, and I appreciate um, it is difficult when you've got to pay for stuff behind the paywall. Um, oh, hold on. Have I put in the wrong password? Okay, let me see. There we go, right. So um, basically you put in your password and then it comes up with extra content. All the kind of year 13 stuff is behind a paywall. It doesn't cost much. And yeah, basically the fact that I do charge for this allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. If I'd never charged anything for this material, then I'd have probably made 200 videos and then stop there and never continue doing what I'm doing. And I would not be doing this tonight. Um, but yeah, basically you can find stuff here about capacitors, um, uh, charging a capacitor, uses of capacitors. There's also these things here um, where you can actually look at deriving for certain things. So for example, if you click on capacitors in series, you'll find here that there's some worksheets. Um, Honkus, thank you so much, five pounds. Very nice. Cool, Honkus, again, I absolutely appreciate this so much. So your donations um, are really, really useful and they go back into my business to make it feeling better, to make it better and better. Um, so yeah, if you look on this and you look at the solution, what you'll find is something where you can download. And this one here is how to derive capacitors in series. Um, oh, right, uh, Josh, I will come back to your question in a minute, Josh, about long answer questions. So yeah, what I've got here, uh, basically all the derivations for A-level physics. You can download this again completely for free. Uh, when you go to the website, it will prompt you to do that. Um, and basically I just show how any der derivations or kind of things that you might need to know about can be derived from like first principles. So I've got all of that stuff on the website. Uh, the other thing I have on the website, um, if I just go back, is there are also videos where I actually explain this as well. So it's not just a downloadable worksheet. There's actually the fact that if you want to, uh, you can listen to me explaining it. So that's my hands on this desk on a video underneath my hands on this desk. Um, Checked. We can say oh. B is equal. So again, what I want to do is try and not just have worksheets that you can access, but also um, I want you to kind of have the opportunity to access explanations from a teacher. Um, Bubby73, three people trying to outbid each other in the chat. That is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Bubby. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Right, um, the question that uh, Josh said, uh, love, love the work, had to retake phys physics this year. Actually, that's really interesting because a lot of people assume that everybody does physics, gets the grades, goes to university, is absolutely fine. Lots of people do retake it, and I suppose in school, you're not really aware of that. So Josh, I hope that everything is going well for you. Uh, I know you're gonna be absolutely fine. Um, can I cover long answer questions? Right, the biggest thing that I would say about long answer questions is don't avoid them, don't leave them till the end, but also, don't forget some of the key points. And this is the thing that, for me personally, I like the maths. I love doing maths questions because you can just write a few numbers down. And maybe it's because I'm a little bit lazy, but I don't like writing too much. Um, Fraser Steele, thank you again. Uh, I am your Lord and Saviour. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the donation. Um, yeah, I would say that with long answer questions, let, let me just go through some key points, okay? The first of all, first of all, with a long answer question, which all of you will be given, 
The first thing is, is um, don't avoid them, especially when you're doing, um, especially when you are doing past papers. Don't think, well, I'll do the maths ones first and I'll come back and do the wordy ones. Don't avoid them when you're practicing. Secondly, um, a lot of the marks are easy, okay? And you often get easy marks, including in a long answer question, for doing things like a diagram and making sure that that has labels on it. For example, if you're describing an experiment, a diagram can be used, or equally, there might be something where you have a graph, okay? And maybe this is how you use that data, maybe what you plot on the graph, and therefore that can help your explanation, okay? These easy marks often are there, but people think that because it's a six mark, it's gonna be super difficult. There might also be marks within that um, just for actually writing down um, the definition, okay? This is especially true if you have questions which might be to do with like Lenz's law, uh, Faraday's law about what we mean by induced EMF and so on. So it might be a question about generators, or it might be a question about how this electromagnetic induction happens, and you might get one or two marks just by stating Lenz's law and what that means. Okay, so don't forget that even though it might be a six mark question, there might be marks available for definitions within that. Um, the next thing is, if you've got a question like this, I would say 90% of the time you want to be writing in bullet points, okay? Bullet points like this can help you as you structure your answer, and that means if you know it's a five mark answer, then you can get five separate points within the bullet points. People who are marking your paper like bullet points because it makes, makes their job easier, okay? And the other thing about it is, um, you don't have to aim for 100% on that question, okay? So you don't need to get six out of six. You don't even need to get five out of six. But if you were to aim for four out of six, that's still basically 67%. And often when you look at the grade boundaries, 67% is like an A grade or even an A star. So just because you might lose a couple of marks, don't worry about it, okay? And I would say, that um, if you think, okay, I'm gonna go into this question, it's a long answer question, there might be six marks available, but I'm gonna go for four easy marks. You might get a couple of marks for di a diagram and some definitions, um, and then there's gonna be another couple of marks that you can get. Now, I would say that if you do that, it means you're much more likely to spend the time doing that question, and that means you're much more likely to actually get the easy marks and hoover up those easy marks at the start. And that's the same for anybody doing any exam board. Uh, Daniel Speller, um, thank you so much. It says I can, s how do I celebrate? Okay, yeah, Daniel, again, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, I really do appreciate people like you and everybody else out there who um, is you know helping with the super chat. And also I appreciate all of you tonight for spending a little bit of time having a look at this. Um, so let's see if some comments. Uh, yeah, I'm panicking, honestly. Yeah, don't panic, there's absolutely no point. I understand it, it's completely natural to have a bit of a panic, a bit of a stressful moment, and also, um, if you are panicking, it means that you're maybe not doing the work that you should be doing, or even doing the things that you should be doing. So rather than panicking and like endless scrolling on your phone, put it down, you know, maybe stop the live stream, go out for a little walk and just get some fresh air, because it's nice and sunny at the moment in England. Um, and maybe just that'll settle you down and you can come back in, get some good rest tonight, and in the morning, it's another day. Um, okay, uh, somebody's saying 50% this year for an A star. Do you know what? I reckon on AQA paper one, I reckon if you've got 50% of the marks available, then that is the kind of thing that will be getting you to those A grades and A star grades. So I think the grade boundaries are gonna be super low this year. We'll see. Um, right. Um, Okay, can I? Can you borrow my brain? Um, I'm afraid not. To be honest, my brain is like it's it's good at physics. It's it's absolutely rubbish at A level maths. It's rubbish at A level chemistry, A level biology, A level economics, all the other things you're doing. Because I'm in a position where all I'm doing is just A level physics repeatedly. So I've specialised in that area, 
but I've completely forgotten everything else about all of the other subjects. So you might have my brain, but I don't think it would help you in any of your other exams. Um, right. Um, is it bad that you're already considering retaking? Do you know what? If you retake it, it's not a big deal. Honestly, by the time you get to university, nobody cares what you got at, you, at, at, at A level. Nobody cares if you've retaken the exams. It's basically a completely fresh start. And if you've gone back a year or you've had a year out and then done some work and then retaken your exams, literally nobody cares. Okay, um, right. Uh, what about OCR? Let's see. Okay, so should I take a gap year? That's a great question. Um, personally, I didn't because I couldn't wait to get uh, away from where I lived. I mean, I liked it now, but I was just desperate to move on from like school and go to university. It, it really depends on you. Um, if you do a gap year or even two gap years, by the time you're 40, it's completely irrelevant. Um, and actually, I wish I spent a bit more time not working around university. So, yeah, don't worry about that. Um, OK, so um, do I have any predictions about what might come up? I have no predictions at all. And I don't think that you can predict what might come up on the paper. And I think it's a very risky strategy to think, well, that topic came up last year. I'm not going to do any revision on that because it won't come up this year. There will always be questions that are going to be very similar to last year or the year beforehand. And the idea that you can go through the specification, tick off the topics that have come up previously and think they're not going to be asked about again, that is, I don't think, a wise solution. The best thing to do is to revise everything and expect anything could come up. OK, um, so who's going to miss me, Izzy, uh, when, I'm, when you're in uni? Yeah, um, I'll still be here. I'll be doing videos more about kind of learning and how to revise. So even if you're at uni next year, I'm going to try and do more sort of educational content. So not just about A-level physics, but how to study, how to stay motivated, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, basically the new Ali Abdal. OK, um, right. Um, OK, let's have a look. Um, so, so there's lo loads of questions here. Um, can we do some moving charged particles and electric and magnetic fields? Hi, hi. Yeah, let's do that. OK, so this is something that all of you, um, if you're doing fields, are going to be coming up against. And this is just revision. OK, so if you have a charged particle, let's say it's a positively charged particle, and this is in a magnetic field, uh, I'm just going to do some crosses here. Again, the crosses, in this case, are supposed to be sort of fairly uniformly spread out. Uh, this just shows that we have this uniform field, in this case going into the paper. Now, when that's moving, this will experience a force. Now, don't forget, um, you know, for example, we know that um, the gravitational field is equal to the force per unit mass, okay? The electric field is equal to the force per unit positive charge. I'm just gonna put um, a plus down here. And we also have the magnetic field, and that's the force on a charged particle which is moving, okay? So I think that these three go together. We're looking at the force per unit mass for gravitational fields, force per unit charge for electric fields, and the force per unit charge which is moving in a magnetic field. That's maybe a little bit untidy. So this equation here is super important. Um, and again, this is going to be uh, something which um, it, all of you need to know about. Now, I would say that if you're doing questions about charged particles and magnetic fields, then you've got to remember that in a magnetic field, we tend to get a circular path. Whereas if you had a charged particle in an electric field, you have a parabola. And that's going to be, is that how you spell parabola? And therefore, you cannot forget the work you've already done on Suvat equations of motion. Okay, And there might then be this um, comparison between how, how a charged particle moves in an electric field and also how a particle with mass moves in a gravitational field. So there might be, you know, like a ball moving in a gravitational field. It's going to have the same path as maybe an electron moving in an electric field. OK. Um, uh, parabolic means circle or just a curve. OK, so Izzy, yeah. Basically, a parabola is where it might have the constant horizontal motion like this. OK. 
So maybe in the horizontal direction, that stays constant. But in the vertical direction, it's going to increase like this. Okay. And again, this is exactly what happens to uh, maybe an object which is undergoing projectile motion. And that means the resultant of these two things looks like this. And because of that, what we get is this curve like this. That's different to what happens in the magnetic field, where the force, so maybe this is um, a charged particle moving at a velocity v. The force in this case is always going to be at right angles to the motion. Again, you can remember that using things like Fleming's left-hand rule. There's always going to be 90 degrees between all of this stuff here. Um, and that means this is going to cause this to move in a circular path. Because when it gets to here, for example, and it's moving in this direction, the force is still at 90 degrees to it. And that means it's changing the direction, but not the speed. OK. Um, OK. Um, I would say as well, um, OK, there are lots of great comments here. Um, I would say that the left hand rule is the one you need to think about the whole time. OK, um, the left hand rule, again, it's just what you did at GCSE. It's exactly the same. You know, you've got the force or the the, mo the the move, the movement that maybe something might undergo. You've got the first finger is the magnetic field from pot, from north to south, and then the second finger, and this is super important. Second finger is conventional current. So that works in this example here. So we might have, um, you know, something which is moving here. We know the field is going into the page. We know that the current is kind of moving in that direction, and actually in this example here, the force would be upwards. So maybe that's that's like a negative thing. Yeah, the force should be going up. Uh, it's same. What I'm going to do here is say that this is negative. Okay, so that's a negative particle uh, moving in that field. So, yeah. Again, do this in the exam. Um, just make sure that you're very clear and do this several times. But yeah, in this example here, it's a negative particle. So if it's negative and it's moving in this direction, that's the same as saying it's positive in that direction. So that finger goes there, that goes there, and my thumb is pointing down. Very difficult to show. Okay. Um, yeah, gang signs in the exam hall. Um, yeah, I would say, of course, uh, Zanar, that parabolic is electrical, and therefore you might need to consider using Suvat equations. Magnetic fields is to do with circular motion. And, of course, what you'll find in the exams you've got um, quite soon is that a lot of the stuff that you're doing is going to bring many topics together. So if there's a question about, and I think this is a really nice question, if there's a, if there's a question about an electric field, then it might link back to how that's related to a gravitational field, and then you might use Suvat's equations. There might also be a question about particles in the magnetic field, and therefore this links on to the work you've done on circular motion. And the question I put up um, today um, on the, and I think people really, for some reason, people absolutely love doing these multiple choice questions on YouTube, um, is you can say that, okay, the force is equal to B Q V, okay? And this V is the velocity of a charged particle of charge Q moving in a field of strength B. And if we equate that to the um, centripetal force, mv squared over r, we can say that bqv is equal to mv squared over r. Of course, we've got a v on both sides, so they cancel. And therefore, we can say that bq is equal to mv over r. And often, this is something which might get you one or two easy marks. OK, um, it might be that they want you to work out the radius. So here, the radius would be equal to mv divided by bq. Or effectively, the radius depends upon the momentum of the particle, the charge on it, and the strength of that field. OK, um, <laughs> some crazy kind of things people are talking about there. Um, can you explain why the particle must be moving to experience the force in a magnetic field, MTT? Great to have you back, MTT. Um, yeah, it's... Why is that? Why does a charged particle have to experience a force? Um, I, I can't give you the best answer at the moment about why it has to be moving to experience a force. 
other than um yeah maybe this is it so if you've got an electron okay think about it like this right this is um yeah i think it's um I have people want to make a mountain bike channel callum yeah i should do because i can't like riding my bike and basically the other day i spent monday i thought i'm not gonna go to work i'm not a teacher anymore i don't have to go to work i can just do whatever i want every day apart from the kind of stress of having to earn money um, and I've had a lovely day today. Actually, I've been in a school in Bath called Ralph Allen, um, helping out their teachers do some stuff at GCSE. So I've had a lovely day talking to teachers and like looking at practical stuff. It's a great day today. Um, but yeah, maybe I need to make a mountain bike channel so I can put all my mountain bike stuff through the business expenses. Anyway, I'll see that. Um, okay, I would say that if you've got a wire, then there's going to be no a magnetic field around it unless the electrons in it actually are moving. As soon as you have moving charges, they produce around them this magnetic field. So I'm going to do these kind of concentric circles that get further apart. Okay, And it's really the fact that if you've got, if you've got charges that move, there's therefore going to be a B field um, created. And it's this magnetic field of these moving charges that interacts with maybe the B field or the magnetic field, which is maybe a permanent one around it. So what you have is in order for the electric, ch electrically charged particles to experience the force in the permanent magnetic field, it can only be when they're moving, because when they move, they make their own magnetic field that interacts with this magnetic field. Okay, um, right. Okay, there's so many questions. Uh, Izzy, again, don't stress, there's no point in that. Uh, true, um, yeah, inshallah, we'll all smash the exam. Hopefully all of, yep. Yeah. Uh, can I do capacitors? Um, right, so, what was the initial velocity of the jumping girl in paper one? That is a really hard question, okay? Um, for some of you who did, uh, I think, one of the paper one questions, it was about, you know, what is the estimation of the velocity of somebody jumping up? Um, those questions, none of you know that, but it, it's something you just don't need to worry about because if you're not sure about it, nobody else is. And it's just asking you to estimate the size of some physical quantities. You know, what's the approximate height that somebody can jump to? What's the approximate mass of a person? And if you know that, uh, you can do other things. Um, A-level physics is boring, says Ethan Hope. No, A-level physics exams are boring. Physics itself is actually really, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I would say that the problem all of you have at the moment is because of just the way the world works is you have to do exams. And that means you have to know about boring things that you just have to write down off by heart. The reality is, is that physics is absolutely amazing and there are some amazing parts of it, but when it comes to exams, we sometimes leave out the interesting bits and just focus on the more detailed but like essential basics, okay? Um, and if you, you know, listen to stuff in the media and you watch TV programs, they talk about amazing things and, you know, things like AI, for example, that's absolutely incredible. And it's relying on a lot of the kind of sort of basics that you learn about in maths and physics and computing. And that's absolutely fantastic in terms of potentially what it could be doing. Um, however, um, I would say that um, some of this can be a little bit dull, but you've just got to get through it. It's part of the game. Play the game, get your grades, you move on to the next stage. OK, um, right. So there's so many questions here um, and some of them, Nick about nuclear density is the same for all nucleons. Um, let's have a look. So, to be honest, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Let's have a look. So, um, so that video, I've got it. Again, if, if there's anything that you need specific help with, I appreciate there are so many amazing people out here tonight that I can't answer every one of your questions. Um, I might answer Josh's about kinetic theory though. Um, okay, so let's go back a minute. Let's have a look at nuclear physics. Um, <laughs> Callum, thank you so much. Uh, £1.99 towards the mountain bike channel. Uh, I will do some more mountain bike videos because it's, it's nice just to go and play on my bike in the woods. Also, for all of you out there, you can still be in your 40s and just mess around on your bike in the woods. It's absolutely a valid way to spend your life. Um, 
Okay, so where would this be? So, um, it's definitely somewhere in here. Alpha scattering. No. Um, is it radiation? I definitely have stuff about the nucleus in here. Um, Do you know what? I should know my website better than this, really, shouldn't I? It's a while since I've looked at these pages in particular. Radioactive decay. Um, no. I definitely have a video all about the density of the nucleus. Um, I will come back to you on that. Okay, if you're ever on my website, um, then what you can always look at is a full video list. It's down in the bottom in the footer. This has a link to all of the videos that I've done, and there will be something about size, mass, and density of the nucleus. So this one over here has, um, yeah, this video here has stuff on it about, let me see, same hand, as, as a few years ago um, yeah so there's some stuff here where I explain that in a little bit more detail about how um, the average density of the nucleus is going to be the same for all different things hopefully that helps that's probably not the best way of explaining is it um, uh, okay cyclotrons do you know what? I don't know if I've got a video about cyclotrons um, so, what what would you like to know about the cyclotron in particular? Because I think the cyclotron is a great example. One point four times ten to the power k. Uh, One point four times ten to the seventh bonkers. I don't know what you're talking about, but thank you for the donation again. Um, I think there are certain things that might come up that some of you might be asked questions about. And this could include things like cyclotrons, synchrotrons, I think I spelled that wrong, and velocity selectors. Now for all of these, um, even if you're doing OCR, you might be, um, you still might be asked a question about it. Because a lot of these are just questions about electric and magnetic fields. Okay? Now, you, Synchrotron, synchrotron. Um, okay, don't worry about this. Um, I would say that this stuff here, these are just examples. And these are ways where they try and fit the practical use. Um, these just basically show the practical use of looking at charged particles and electric or magnetic fields. Okay. Um, somebody don't quite asleep uh, we don't need to know you don't need to know synchrotrons no you don't but they're just examples like a velocity selector might not be something you need to know about and basically a velocity selector is something that is used um, within um, a mass spectrometer or certain types of mass spectrometer to make sure that everything going through is going at exactly the same speed as it goes into a magnetic field now what I want to say is whatever these are don't worry about it if you see an exam question about it don't worry about it either. Um, so, first of all, the magnetic field, what this is going to do is, say you've got a particle which is moving with a certain velocity v, and this has got a charge q, then this is going to cause a force on that particle. So I'm going to call that fv. Okay. Now, that's if you have this particle in the magnetic field. But if you have an electric field, then we might have a charge on that particle, which I'm going to call Fe. Okay. Now, what we know is that the electric field is the force per unit charge. So the electric field strength is going to be equal to the force on that particle per unit charge. And the magnetic field, which I'm going to do in purple, is going to be equal to the, the force, the magnetic force, 
divided by QV. Okay, now I think this is quite an important thing. We know how quickly that particle is going. We know that in the magnetic field, it's going to experience a force due to the magnetic field. It's going to experience a force due to an electric field. And if you have both of these being applied at the same time, we know that that's going to be true. Now, if you have it where the particle goes straight through without being deflected up or down, that can only happen at one certain value of velocity. So we could rearrange this to say that the electric field strength, Fe, is equal to Eq. And when that's equal in size, but opposite in direction to the magnetic field, Fb, that's going to be equal to Bqv. Okay? So what we're doing here is all we're looking at is um, equating the magnetic force to the electric force on a charged particle moving in those fields. Now, of course, the charge here, Q, is going to be the same because it's the same particle. And therefore, what you can say is that the electric field is equal to the magnetic field times its velocity, or actually, sometimes more importantly, the velocity is equal to the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. So this here is for the particular example where you might have two different forces acting on these particles. And that means that these particles, which are going to a certain velocity v, are going to be going through at a straight line. If they're going too slow, so imagine uh, this is the region where we have these charged particles going through. If they go straight through, that's because they've got a velocity v. If they're going a little bit too quickly or a little bit too slowly, they kind of don't follow this straight line because the electric or the magnetic field is going to force on it. It's going to be bigger, so it goes up or down. And that means everything going through this region comes out at the same velocity. Now, that's important because later on, you might then put these particles, which all travel at the same velocity, into another magnetic field. And here, they're going to deflect because we have um, a force acting at 90 degrees to the direction of motion. And that means they follow a circular path until we detect them at the bottom over here. Now, you can see here that this is going to be independent of mass. Okay, so it doesn't matter how massive the particles are. This just depends on how quickly they're moving. And that means if these particles all come in at the same velocity, but they have different masses, in this field, we know that the radius of curvature is equal to mv over bq. Q is going to be the same, V is going to be the same, V is going to be the same, and that means the radius is going to be proportional to the mass. So what we find is that particles which are more massive have a larger radius, and therefore they don't curve as much. And this means we can separate these two things and look at um, maybe the relative abundance of these two different isotopes in something like a mass spectrometer. Now, of course, again, if you're looking at cyclotrons and things like that, then you're going to be using exactly the same equations, but they will be, um, I suspect, quite difficult in terms of the scenario. And it doesn't matter if you're doing AQA or OCR or Edexcel or any other exam board, they might give you a scenario maybe with a cyclotron or some kind of particle accelerator uh, or something where you have par charged particles moving in a real kind of piece of lab equipment. And therefore, don't forget that all you need to do is go back to the basics that you've covered many, many times. Okay, um, right. Um, yeah, I would say that this is a great thing. So Farhan, uh, read the specs, watch summary videos and do a video and do a paper, sorry, and then sleep. Yeah, I think at this point, you know physics. I mean, it's like the night beforehand. If you don't know it now, if there's something you really don't understand, um, then rather than focusing on the thing that you don't understand, concentrate on all the other stuff that you're really, really good at. So that might mean just having a quick look at the specification. And again, there is stuff, I'm going to keep going on about it because I've uh, made this website. Um, there is stuff over at A-Level Physics online. So no matter which exam board you're doing, you can, if you click at the top, say you're doing AQA, you can find the full specification here from the exam board. And you can just have a quick flick through that just to remind yourself of all the topics that you already know about. Um, the other thing here that I do have is I have learning checklists on the website. A lot of you might have used these already, so you can just download this. And again, this learning checklist, which I put together a few years ago now, 
Um, can you remember all of these things, yes or no? Just tick it off. And as you do that, it just means that you're reminding yourself about everything that you currently do know. Okay, so again, A-level physics online, there's some stuff there, and it also links back to the real exam board websites. Um, okay, right. Um, can I rearrange the discharge equation? Uh, I, which one do you mean by that? Um, right, transformers. Um, do I know if a coil contracts or expands when a current goes through it whilst in the magnetic field? Um, that's is that a question from a previous past paper? Um, does a coil contract or expand? If it's a rigid coil, the word rigid means that the, the shape stays the same. So we often talk about like a rigid beam or something like that, and therefore the dimension doesn't change. Um, I would have thought that off the top of my head, I would say the coil expands because when you have a current going through it, the field, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Um, so a coil, does it contract or expand? Okay, so are we talking about, let's have a look at this. So you've got like a coil that's like this and it's in maybe a field where the field is going like this. Okay, so it's like a 3D picture. So the field maybe goes from north to south. Um, I would say that what you'd have is if you think about the coil, you're going to have a field going this way and that's going to interact with the field going that way. I reckon it contracts because effectively, if you look at a bit here, you've got, this is like one side of it this, this is a difficult question for me to answer because I don't want to make it wrong. So maybe it does something like that. Now, if we think about the field, you've got like a field line going that way and there's another field going that way, which means that these two things here are going in opposite directions. And that means I reckon that it's going to pull, rather than them trying to repel, they're going to be pulled together. So I reckon for that question, a coil will contract slightly if you have a current going through it. Um, somebody's or lots of people are wanting eddy currents okay um, okay eddy currents you do not need to know much about eddy currents okay one good example of eddy currents is if you have like a, maybe a copper tube like this okay and you drop in your I'm sure you've all seen the demo so it looks like this so this is a magnet, uh, maybe it's got like a north end and a south end. When you drop it in here, what we do is we induce a current. Now effectively we've got a really large surface area, or a large area, and that means we're going to have a very low resistance. And that means that you can have electric currents that are going to be really large. So you've got a large cross-sectional area, that means you've got a low electrical resistance, and therefore for a certain EMF that's induced, you will get a large current. And if you have a large current, you therefore have like a large magnetic field. And because the electrons can basically go in multiple different directions, this kind of eddy current means that we have this large magnetic field, which in this case kind of opposes the motion of the thing that's changing it. Now, um, the thing that you have in a transformer is if you just had a solid transformer that looked like this, where you had maybe your primary coil, okay, and then you had like your secondary coil. Oh, I've messed up my drawing. Okay, you primary and secondary. If this was solid, effectively, as soon as you have a magnetic field around this, it's going to cause um, a current that could basically go anywhere. And that means you'd have not just a magnetic field in the coil, you'd also have an electrical current, an electric field in this as well. Now the main thing you've got to remember about transformers is effectively we have electricity here, we have magnetic field which is being conducted around the middle and that then causes like electricity at the other side. You don't want to have any electricity flowing inside that coil. 
Okay, so instead, what you have is if you take this solid bit of metal, if you think about where the electrons go, they could go absolutely anywhere like this. Okay, if instead you have something which has a small gap between these bits, then it means that suddenly rather than the electrons going anywhere, they can only go a smaller distance, and that means there's going to be less current. In actual fact, what lots of transformers do is they have these laminations. So you have like an insulator, a bit of metal, insulator, a bit of metal, insulator. And often the thing here, the insulator is just some kind of like varnish or like a, a coating on that. Now, of course, what you might have in a real transformer is if you were to make this even smaller and you almost like have a metal powder that's kind of separated in some kind of resin or something like that, you still have a lot of metal there. So we can still have this magnetic field being transmitted. But now we almost have like a matrix of like metal powder in amongst something which is um, which can't conduct any electricity because we have laminations like this way and in this direction as well. And if you do that, it means that the eddy currents are going to be really small because they can't move around at all. And if you reduce the eddy currents, you're going to reduce any heating effects in that coil, and that's going to make it approach 100% efficiency. So all of the power in is equal to the power out. Okay, um, right, I hope that helps. Um, can I go through the kinetic theory of gases derivation? Um, Okay, so uh, it's supposed to be long, but it has not come up on any papers before, and it could on this one. Uh, Ewan, right, great, great question. Um, let me have a look. So I think um, I do have, let's have a look. I might have, I think I've got a derivation for that. Sorry about this. So um, again, on my website, if you look at the bottom, there are derivations. If you click on that you'll find all the derivations that you might need to know about and this one is to do with um, kinetic theory so if you want to know about kinetic theory so PV equals a third NMC bar squared um, the solution for that is this okay now um, this is where you have a cube of size L and again I've got a video on the website where I talk through this so imagine you've got a uh, one particle of mass m moving at a speed v it collides with the other wall and then it bounces back and if it's an elastic collision then that means it's going to have the same speed but in the opposite direction okay so the change in momentum is equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum which is equal to mv minus minus mv which is equal to 2mv if you know that, then the force that it imparts on the wall each time is equal to the change of momentum over time, which is 2mv over t. Of course, the time between collisions, well, we know that the speed is equal to 2l over t. So if we know um, it goes between collisions, it takes the time t to go from here to here and back again. So the time between collisions, t, is related to the speed and 2l. And this is where you've got a cube of side L. So T is 2L over V. So you put that in here to say that the force is equal to 2MV over 2L over V, which is equal to MV squared over L. Okay. Um, now, that's if you've got just the X direction. But of course, the total force is going to be equal to the X and the Y and the Z direction. Um, and therefore, that's going to be equal to NMC bar squared over L where n is just the number of particles. You put this in here, uh, so the pressure is the for total force over the area. The total force is this, the area of each side is L squared, hopefully this is making sense. Uh, and therefore that's this over L cubed, which is equal to big V, the volume of that thing. Um, and yeah, basically this is what you need to know. Now if you don't know it now, that's fine. You can just find this on my website, you can download it. Um, and also you can download this completely for free because if you go back to um, the website, and if you, let me just go back again. So uh, if I refresh that page, it might be um, here, 40 important derivations. So if you go to A-level physics tonight, you can download the 40 most important derivations for A-level. And that means you can just flick through that before you go to sleep. Just remember what you've already known about 
Um, and yeah, there we go. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions that any people have? And then basically, what I don't want to go on too much about is... Um, I don't want to kind of spend too long going on about stuff tonight because, um, yeah, basically, you know what you need to know by now. Um, I reckon by now, the decay constant, ideal gas laws, binding energy, binding energy. Um, right. Let's just do a couple of little questions and then I'll leave all of you now to like basically... Um, just spend a little bit more time just having a look through the specification just reminding you about every just remind yourself about everything that might come up and then basically um, in the exam tomorrow don't forget that if there's a hard question that's difficult it's going to be difficult for everybody doing the exam a lot of that question is going to be based on stuff that you do know and you have covered but it might be like a really weirdly worded question or it might be something that um, you know the physics, but you don't understand which bit of physics to go for. And therefore, I would say, in order to make sure that you don't run out of time, just do all of the easy questions first of all. And that means you can whiz through most of the paper, um, you know, maybe spend a couple of minutes at the start just looking through it all. You know then the easy questions which might come up. And don't forget as well, question one might be difficult and question eight might be quite easy. So sometimes the later questions... They might be about a different topic, but there still might be lots of easy marks available within that. And that means as you go into the exam, you can get all of the easy marks done, first of all, and then you can then go back and have a go at the things which are a little bit more tricky. And at the, the final kind of, kind of couple of minutes, if there's anything you're not sure about, just guess what the answer might be. And you might be correct. You never know. Um, OK, so um, I think that's about it, really. Uh, how come you don't do like a walkthrough of past papers? I have done some walkthroughs of past papers. Um, I haven't done as many because they take quite a long time to do, but I will get to do more in the future. If you look to my website, for example, if you go to AQA and you go to past papers, um, you click on that link here, you'll find like my 2020 A-level video walkthroughs. So you can go on here. Um, I've got paper one. I've got paper two from 2020. So if you want to see my work solutions to this paper, you can go here and that's again uh, everything that you need Welcome to know. Welcome to paper two for AQA A-level physics. And therefore what I have on this video here is I have the grey boundaries, I think they come up in a sec, um, and I just basically go through the whole paper and my work solutions. Um, I'm not just doing AQA, but I will be doing uh, other things over the next year. It's actually weird how there's so much I need to do and it's like what's taken me most of the time this year which just means I haven't been doing as many past papers as I wanted um, I'm basically doing these books here so if you're in year 12 you need to get this book and I'm sh I guarantee if you've got this book and you've worked through it you will find in a year's time that actually the exams are going to be quite easy so I would say anybody watching this in year 12 or anybody in year 13 you probably should have bought this book and this would have helped you but this has lots and lots of questions and also tips on how to prepare for exams and so on so if you are in year 12 buy my books that will help all of you a lot um, and that means when it comes to doing your exams uh, next year it should be a lot easier so yeah um <laughs> right so yeah and yeah um i am selling stuff but also i'm selling stuff that has i think a lot of value to you and i know lots of you out there will have uh, been using my resources i would say that probably i've got a thousand videos on youtube for free i've got all the physics and math tutor solutions for free but obviously if you want to get the edge if you want to really help yourself um then you can pay for a little bit of extra content i'm trying to keep it affordable and of course if you have paper three coming up or you have practical exams i do have on my physics online shop i've got um practice papers for aqa 3a and i've got a practice paper bundle for OCR and for Edexcel which are based on the kind of practical skills that might come up in the future exams so yeah go and buy those that'd be great do I think AQA boundaries will go up this year I reckon this year the same number of students are going to get the same kind of grades that they would have done in previous years before the pandemic but I think that there's going to be quite low grade boundaries is that right 
uh, you need a low number of actual marks to get a top grade because the paper one in particular is being very, very difficult. Um, okay, hopefully that's all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's leave this. Again, if there's anything else that... Uh, this guy is so cheeky, yeah. Um, anything else that you need help with, you can find it on my website. You can find stuff on YouTube and hopefully uh, this will help you tomorrow. Again, do let me know um, in the comments how you find the paper. Um, there'll be various videos you can leave comments on um, and it'd be great to find out how you got on. Hopefully it all goes well, uh, but I wish all of you the best of luck. Um, and yeah, apart from that, um, good night, good luck, and I hope it all goes really, really well. Thank you.